Hey everybody, Michael Snyder, Pacific Northwest Weather Watch, and tonight we are going to do another of the windstorm series, the greatest windstorms to ever strike the Pacific Northwest. Taking a look tonight at the December 14, 15, 2006 Hanukkah Eve windstorm. You can see on the infrared satellite imagery here, this was quite the monster. High winds all the way from Northern California across to the central BC coastline there. There were some deaths involved and some very strong winds raked the entire region here. We'll look into some of these details here coming up in a minute. First of all, looking at the mid-level water vapor loop again, you can see just how large the storm was coming across the region here. The most powerful storm winds of the storm were back here in the bent back occlusion of this storm here that really moved across from Western Washington and British Columbia as well, as well as hitting the Oregon coast and Willamette Valley quite hard also. Look at some of those wind speeds here coming up in a moment. Now, taking a look here, the National Weather Service had a vote on the name of the storm here. I think this is actually a really good idea here because a lot of good um, submissions came in here. 6,255 emails, 8,000 windstorm name nominations here. 39 people chose the Hanukkah Eve storm. Then they drew one of those names out of the 39. It was Clyde Hill of Burien that won the contest there. But I think that's a good name. I think it's a really good idea too. It kind of helps solidify which storm you're talking about here. There's some windstorms that are uh, pretty powerful from the past that don't have actual names. And I think it helps identify those storms. So very good idea overall, I think. Now, taking a look here, this is kind of a common scene around the area. Large trees down across the region here. We'll look at some of the details as why the storm was so destructive also here. But nice picture here about what the damage a tree can do. As you can see, you wouldn't want to be in a vehicle when a tree that size hits you. So uh, Christine Gregoire declared a state of emergency in 17 western Washington counties. It was 11 days before all the service was restored power-wise to all the customers in western Washington. You can see that some areas of North Bend were out um, for over six days here. And it's still after six days, I think it was or three days there, 40 roads in King County were still blocked by fallen trees. Numerous roads, too many to count, were blocked during portions of the storm also. And we'll take a look at some more details on the power outages here in a moment. But here you can see the track of the low pressure, and you can see some extremely intense winds all the way up Vancouver Island, the central coastline there, into the interior southwest BC, 69 at SeaTac, Tacoma, Big winds up over 90 miles per hour along some of the Washington and Oregon coast here. Huge winds across the Cascades. We'll get some of those detailed winds here in a moment also. Now, this really hit SeaTac pretty hard there as well. This was the SeaTac strongest gust ever recorded in the ASOS area, era. And the ASOS is a five second wind speed sample here. And some of the older um, anemometers used to be one second or instantaneous gust wind speeds. So we'll look at that and break that down a little bit here in a moment also. So at SeaTac Airport, there was some damage to some of the concourses there, windows blown out, and there was uh, numerous flight delays. The airport was actually closed for a time as well due to power outages there also. Um, and again, the, the tree damage was quite extensive across the region. So many people out of power for several days. Roads were blocked. All kinds of issues came with this storm. Now, this is what I was talking about as far as the five-second um, gust coming up here. So some of the stations that we use now, like the Davis Vantage Pro, have 2.5, but the ASOS uses five seconds. So it's going to register a little bit lower speed there. And 69 miles per hour was only exceeded by a couple storms ever in SeaTac's history back in the 50s there. But those were using um, probably the one-second instant gust variety here. So 69 could have been as high as 75 or even 80 miles per hour had it been using the same anemometer there. And I'll show you why that possibility exists here or how we calculated it anyway. So um, as the 1958 storm came through Hoquiam, it had a one minute wind speed of 52 miles per hour and it gusted to 81 there, for example, here. Seattle had a two minute wind speed averaging 52 miles per hour there. So that's a good indicator. There was probably some gusts up towards 80 miles per hour across some of the Seattle Metro with this storm. Just incredible wind speeds there. If you break it down to one minute, Seattle was probably at 55 miles per hour average during that one minute wind speed, which that gives pretty good credibility that there was some gusts up towards the 80 mile per hour mark there for SeaTac. Normandy Park is about two miles west of SeaTac there. And I've talked to some of the old timers here and they explained to me and have showed me pictures of the extreme damage here along the coast of the Puget Sound with this windstorm back in 2006 here. So I believe 
believe I would not doubt it at all if there were gusts to 80 miles per hour, even maybe a little bit stronger here across some of the coastline here on the Puget Sound. Just a truly memorable storm overall here across the Puget Sound. Now taking a look here, over 1.5 million people lost power at times across the Pacific Northwest. Over 15 deaths due to drowning, trees falling, and carbon monoxide poisoning. Hundreds of others were treated due to carbon monoxide poisoning as well. So much so that the Seattle Times was writing special editions in their papers talking about the threat of carbon monoxide poisoning, which is usually caused by barbecuing or generators in the house or the garage there. Seems to get people every single time and we have a big windstorm event here. So if you know anybody who may be doing that or that does not understand this threat, let them know, please. Now, taking a look at this, Seattle School District and many districts surrounding closed, marking the first time that Seattle schools were closed for a weather-related reason other than snow. Very interesting. Uh, I wonder if, how the kids felt about that back then. You'd rather it be snow than a damaging windstorm, though, probably. Now, taking a look here, 10,000 trees in Stanley Park, British Columbia, broken or uprooted. Incredible $9 million damage was reported just in the park here. And it's a very beautiful area up there also. 2014 Stanley Park was the top park in the world rated by Trip Advisor there. Southwest BC hit very hard, especially the electrical grid out there during this storm also. Now, looking at Oregon coast wind speeds, look at Newport, Rockway Beach. Some of these areas up over 90 miles per hour, just ridiculous gusts showing up there. You can see all the way down to Newport and Florence, 75 plus, very strong winds. Look at some of the Mount Hood Meadows, the Cascades Timberline out there, Government Camp, the Coastal Range, Mount Hebo, an incredible 114 miles per hour there. Very intense storm. There was gusts to 113 in some of the Washington Cascades, and the Washington coast was hammered extremely hard well with this system also. Looking at Willamette Valley, look at Salem, Vancouver. This is just north end of Washington. Bush Prairie there, Portland, southeast. Dallas, 70 miles per hour. Forest Grove, 70. Impressive gusts into the metro area there around Portland as well. Now, taking a look at some of the meteorology behind this event here. Look at that low as it comes. You can clearly see it there. Very intense gradient on the south side. I believe about 16 millibars, 15.9 if I am not mistaken. I believe it's the most intense gradient ever measured between SeaTac and Portland there. We back up a little bit here too. It had a big brother storm with it that was just about as strong or maybe even a little stronger, but it moved north away from most of the population there. So that's why the Hanukkah Eve storm here got all the attention because it struck you know, huge populated areas here across the west coast. So now... Taking a little bit closer look here, you can see that intense pressure gradient here between SeaTac and Portland shown here. This was right after midnight on Thursday going into Friday the 15th there. Just an incredibly intense storm there. Now looking at this, we're going to go forward. I'm still going forward here, but this is backing up. And you can see the rich moisture brought up ahead of this. You can kind of imagine this gradient with the cold air behind the frontal system there and this atmospheric river pointed into the Pacific Northwest. Tropical moisture made it out in front. There were some one hour rainfall records broken across the area here. So we're going to trace this back. Look at the Hanukkah Eve storm here. Now we're going back across the Pacific here. Still going across the Pacific here. And now look here. There's a big brother storm here. And there's the Hanukkah Eve storm there, kind of like the little brother here. And you can see these guys developed here off the coast of Japan there. Now more on that here in a moment. Now here comes the big brother for the Hanukkah Eve storm here. And look at this. That's the Hanukkah Eve storm. You see that little bit of energy there? Big brother starts leading the way across the Pacific here. There he goes. There's the Hanukkah Eve storm. Looks pretty harmless back there, doesn't he? Huge, deep low out in front of the Hanukkah Eve storm racing across the Pacific there. And now you can see it. Big brother goes slamming into Haida Gwaii in southeast Alaska. And the Hanukkah Eve storm hot on its heels just completely obliterates the Pacific Northwest here as you go on in through Friday, very early morning there. I believe the highest wind gust at SeaTac was right around 1 a.m. in the morning. That one will keep you up all night there. Now, taking a look at the entire Pacific Ocean here, this is precipitable water here. So watch out here. This is the Hanukkah Eve storm and its big brother forming out here. So watch this going across the ocean, just a monster storm. And you might have your eyes set on that, but the big one, the big threat in the Pacific Northwest is back here, the Hanukkah Eve storm. So there goes big brother into Southeast Alaska here, but here comes the Hanukkah Eve storm, pumping that tropical moisture up across the region, bringing additional rainfall that really saturated the soils across Pacific Northwest as 
well, really enhancing the tree falls across the area and did cause one death due to drowning there. Then you can see the windstorm impact Pacific Northwest there. Now we're looking at 18,000 feet, 500 millibar temperature here. And you can see this huge polar lobe out here, this very tight gradient with this tropical and subtropical air just to the south of it here. So you can imagine the jet stream that would be developed here off the coast of Asia here, racing across the Pacific Ocean here. Here goes Big Brother Storm up into Southeast Alaska there. And then you can see the polar lobe with the Hanukkah Eve Storm back here. Very tight gradient, very warm tropical air to the south, very cold polar Arctic air to the north here. And look at this just comes flying into the Pacific Northwest here on the morning of the 15th shown there. Nice polar lobe, very tight gradient moving onto the West Coast there. This is at 30,000 feet here, and you usually don't get to see temperature gradients like this, but even at 30,000 feet, you can clearly see where the Hanukkah Eve storm was here with the warm air moving out in front of the cyclone there as it eventually moved across the Pacific Northwest shown here. Now looking at this, this is the jet stream at 30,000 feet also, and you, this is all the way back in December 10th. You can see the jet stream racing off the coast of Asia here, out across the Pacific Ocean here. There goes Big Brother Storm on in through the 13th of South East Alaska there, and then you can see the Hanukkah Eve storm move in there as we go on to the 14th and 15th there. But just a very powerful jet stream brought those across quite quickly all the way across the ocean into the Pacific Northwest. Now taking a look here, this is 850 millibars, 5,000 feet. There goes Big Brother Storm up there. You can see it moving up towards Haida Gwaii there, central BC here. But then you can see the Hanukkah Eve Storm. I mean, just look at these winds. Just a beautiful cyclone out here. Just an intense storm all the way from California, all the way up through BC. You can really see those powerful winds at 5,000 feet impact the entire region there. So that combined with, uh, combined with the powerful winds, um, you know, some of the Pacific Northwest was getting over 200% of precipitation during the previous month. SeaTac actually recorded over 15 inches during November 2006 there. So it was just primed for some huge tree falls there. And then you bring those really intense winds. And in some areas, they're most intense winds ever. And you get the disaster that is the Hanukkah Eve storm. So this is some other tragedy that happened with the storm. Incredible one-hour rainfall rates just before the powerful winds struck. Seattle received 0.86 inches of rain just between 4 and 5 p.m., leading to major urban flooding there. Now, this led to the death of Kate Fleming. Uh, she was in her basement, and it actually flooded into her basement there. So much runoff of water. Dewey Place East there in Seattle, it broke a retaining wall around, and it flooded into the basement so fast that she could not escape. Um, yeah, so it just busted in there. And, you know, she was a very talented person out there, pretty famous out there. Um, but yeah, this is kind of a, an example of, you know, when you do not have, you know, you have drains that have, are, can even be blocked by leaves and you enhance runoff in certain areas or the runoff is not good in certain areas as well. That's why it's important to have public planning and to know what kind of threats you face as a community to try to avoid tragedies like this. And you can see uh, Fleming's partner Strong had... She was a victim of the Hurricane Katrina just a year before that, too. They lost her, their home in Hurricane Katrina just in that 2005, the year before this as well. So talk about a, a bad streak with um, flooding there. So, and this was also, this is also worth pointing out here. The Hanukkah Eve storm of 2006 was exceptionally well forecasted. I can remember I was living in Hawaii actually at the time, but I read every area forecast discussion. I watched every single model run coming out because you could see this monster coming for very high confidence, like five plus days out, about a week out. So just wanted to point that out. The models handled it well. The National Weather Service did well with the forecasting, and it really struck with the vigor that we feared that it might. So anyway, um, yeah, so I've got three more storms I'm going to do in this series, and they are big one. So we're going to go over those step by step, just like we did here for the 2006 Hanukkah Eve storm as well. Hope you guys are enjoying these here. Um, I'm going to go get some rest and check out the models before I head off to bed. And then I'll get up and I'll do tomorrow's briefing as well. But hopefully you guys like these, you know, let me know if you want to see any other kind of data included in these or what else you'd like to see me cover. And eventually I'm going to switch my attention to the greatest Arctic outbreaks across the Pacific Northwest as well, which is probably going to be just as fun as doing these windstorms also. It's pretty cool looking back and trying to see where these storms develop and how they move across the ocean, for example, as well. And we'll do the same thing with some of 
these um, Arctic outbreaks here once we start that series up as well. But we've got three more to go here in this forecast series for the greatest Pacific Northwest wind storms here. So I hope you guys like the video and um, yeah, so I'll probably have the next one out in the next two to three weeks or so. I'm not going to try not to give it away, but uh, some of them or one or two of them are probably pretty obvious here. I'd be surprised if you couldn't look them up and see what they are, but I'm not going to try to spoil it for anybody. And I'll try to pick out some things that you may not know about these storms as well. So anyway, I'll do my normal briefings tomorrow and I will talk to you guys then.